What determines health? My parents grew up in the New York City area, and when I was about three years of age, we moved to the Philadelphia suburbs. They, my parents were working with a real estate agent, and they noted that that agent was only showing them homes in certain communities. And so they ended up partnering with a local minister and his wife, who were both Caucasian. And the minister and his wife actually posed as individuals who were looking for a home. And it was through this charade that my parents found the home where I grew up. My mother was also a diabetic. And as a child, I would frequently go with her to see her physician. And I was always fascinated by the interactions that she had with her provider. She would frequently get her blood sugars measured. And when she did, her blood sugars would frequently be in the high 200s to 300s. A normal is about 120. On the way home, we would frequently talk about the interaction that she had with her physician. And I would talk to my mother about her blood sugars. And I would say to her, gee, mom, your blood sugars seem awfully high. My mother, in a very loving and caring way, would reassure me and tell me that for her, her blood sugars were actually pretty good. My mother ended up passing away from diabetes at the age of 44, and I was 19 at the time, and I remember wondering if this was some sort of anomaly or not. I went on to medical school and completed residencies in both preventive medicine and internal medicine, and during my training, I would frequently see patients with heart disease and emphysema and cancer, and many of these patients continued to smoke. I would talk with them about their encounters that they had with their physicians, and I would ask them if their physicians had ever talked with them about not smoking. And all too often, the answer to that question was no. You know, today, only 8% of people are receiving the important clinical preventive services they need and are recommended for them. 8%. Wouldn't it be great if instead of that, we could focus more on prevention and health promotion? If we could spend more time with our patients to understand their risk factors? But the reality is how we are trained and how we are reimbursed as physicians, we are rewarded to treat disease, not to prevent disease. I ended up going to the CDC where I spent over 20 years researching racial and ethnic disparities in heart disease and diabetes and cancer. And through that work, I learned that my mother's death in reality was not some sort of an anomaly. But for too many individuals in black and brown communities, they're dying at a younger age for heart disease and diabetes and cancer. I also did some research into my mother's childhood. And I learned very soon that what she was experiencing and that she experienced a number of stressors as a child. And these stressors had a huge impact on her health and well-being. They were stressors like poverty and housing and food insecurity. You know, data from the Adverse Childhood Experiences study shows that physical abuse by itself can increase the risk of heart disease by up to 50%. This is not just true in black and brown communities, but it's true in immigrant populations, veterans, and the population overall. Another patient that I frequently think about is a woman by the name of Mrs. Means. She was 36, she was overweight, she had diabetes much like my mother, and also hypertension and arthritis as well. During one particular visit, she, was, she wanted to talk with me about losing weight. And I got really excited during that visit and was almost jumping out of my seat with excitement because of my interest in health promotion and prevention. And so I said to her, Mrs. Means, we can work together to make something work for you. I said, I want you to start out really slowly, and I want you to go outside and walk up and down your block. There was a brief period of silence, and then Mrs. Means said to me, you know, Dr. Giles, it's not safe for me to walk in my community. And I immediately came back with a response, and I said, no problem, Mrs. Means, we can make it work. 
I want you to go to the mall and walk for 10 or 15 minutes at the mall. Again, there was this brief period of silence. She had a bewildered look on her face. And then she said, Dr. Giles, for me to go to the mall, I've got to take three buses, and it's going to take me 45 minutes each way. That's not going to work for Mrs. Means. The last person I want to talk about is go to today and talk about my uncle, Tommy Wigfall. Tommy is an amazing individual. He loves his cosmopolitan at the end of the day. He loves sports. He's a huge tennis and track fan, and he loves the New York Giants. Every Sunday, he's in his man cave, which has all this New York Giants paraphernalia throughout the room. Tommy also smoked for a number of years, and he has a little bit of emphysema and heart disease and diabetes as well. The second week of March of this year, he developed a cough. That cough got progressively worse. He developed shortness of breath. He went, into, he went to the hospital, and on April 1st, seven days before his 75th birthday, he passed away from the ravages of COVID-19. As I think about each of these individuals, I wonder, is there something that we could have done differently? Could academic institutions and the community come together? And you know, the reality is, this is a model that has worked throughout the decades. In North Karelia, Finland, in the 1970s, a group of women were concerned because their husbands were dying from heart disease at a young age. They went to the government and demanded that the government do something differently. And the government act, asked academic institutions and the community to come together. They developed a program, and through this program, they saw dramatic declines in smoking and cholesterol levels. And most importantly, they saw declines in heart disease as well. More recently, in the 1990s, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention created a program called REACH, Racial and Ethnic Approaches to Community Health. This program funded academic institutions such as my own at the University of Illinois at Chicago and community groups to come together to address race disparities. And through the program, we've seen improvements in fruit and vegetable consumption physical activity, and smoking. Most recently, because of the impact that COVID-19 has had on black and brown communities here in the city of Chicago, Mayor Lightfoot has created a racial ethnic rapid response team. That team has included academic institutions, community-based organizations, Chicago Department of Public Health, and the mayor's office. Together, we're looking and using hyper-local data to target prevention and communication messages and also to target testing to high-impact communities. And through this program, we've seen dramatic declines in mortality in cases of COVID-19. Our work is clearly not completely done, but we've seen dramatic improvements. What if? my uncle, Tommy Wigfall, had had such a program in his community that could have educated him about the importance of avoiding crowds and wearing a mask? What if Mrs. Means had had such a program in her community and they had worked to create safe places to be physically active? And what if my mother had had such a program that could have helped her to manage her diabetes so that she knew glucoses of 290 were not good for her. The reality is this is a model that has worked throughout the decades. We need to scale this model up to improve health and well-being. All we need is the will to make it happen. <laughs>